All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining today for Brain Screens, the Built Environment and Achieving Net Zero. Um, we're here today with Brewster Crosby, and we've also got Ben Horn on uh, from the T on Cladding Systems uh, company, and they're gonna be presenting today's course. Um, my name is Bo, I'm here with Ace Lab. We're helping out with hosting today's course, and I've invited my he colleague Helen here today. She's gonna give a quick few minute introduction on Ace Lab um, and how you can use it for your building product research. And then we'll go ahead and get started with today's uh, webinar information. Um, all right, so with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Helen. Um, Brewster, if you wouldn't mind pausing your screen share for a moment, we'll let Helen share um, some quick information on Ace Lab. And if anybody's interested in learning more, we'll give you some options to follow up with us and book a demo after today's webinar. Yeah, thanks, Bo. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to make this, we're going to try something new today, and I'm going to make it a little bit of an audience interaction. So um, I'm going to share my screen and then feel free to all use the chat and we can do a kind of live search for y'all. And then I'll follow up with where to find your CEU and how to get in touch with the, these wonderful folks when we're finished up here. So, um, all right, can y'all see my screen okay? Good, cool. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that I wanna do with y'all is I wanna do a little search for you with wind on Windows. So um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to our main homepage and then we're gonna type in Windows. Make sure you select products over there, otherwise you would go to brands. And this is where I'm gonna use y'all as my uh, audience interaction here. So what kind of window would you like to look for um, today? Feel free to uh, use the Q&A chat to give a window suggestion. If not, I'll just jump in and pick one. All right. I'll pick I'll... one. Let's go with, oh, someone says folding. Thanks, Richard. All right. Thanks, Richard. No, there we go. Okay. Um, then we select the project that we have set up. So I'm just going to pick one of those there. So as we've gone through this already, this has gone down significantly because we don't have, there aren't that many folding windows out there. So these are the frame materials that are left. So Richard, if you want to let me know what type of, which one of these, or we can pick all of them, whatever you'd like here. I'm going to say, let's go with all of them so we can see more results. Oh, okay. it says aluminum. We'll do aluminum. Then. Aluminum only. Okay, cool. So uh, that'll be 10 windows that we're going to look at. So I'm going to go to the next question here. This is going to be your required energy performance. I am going to select all of these here. Um, next question. You can also select some additional things here. I'm going to go ahead and just go to the next one. If y'all wanted expert help, this is a great spot to reach out. We're going to skip and show results. And so this is what this looks like, y'all. So you can come in, you can see all this great information. And now I could pick one or two of these and um, save and shortlist them to the project. So I'll go ahead and save these two and show y'all quickly. I've got a few others already in there. This will allow you to compare all of those um, products that you've saved across all these different parameters that are set up by our team. So this is what this looks like. Um, I'd be happy to, like we did with Richard, work with y'all, take y'all through what this looks like, find some good products that are great for you. And now one other thing I wanna talk about is how do you find wonderful folks um, like the people presenting today? So you can do that by going to brands at the top and then typing in that manufacturer's name. Um, and then we will go to their page here. So y'all will be able to see where they're located, all this great information, connect with them directly. That'll start a conversation in Ace Lab as well as see all the products they have available. So just some different ways you can use Ace Lab and again, love to meet with y'all. And I will pass that back over to uh, to these guys. Have a good one. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Helen. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, feel free to fill out the poll or let us know if you'd like to book a demo and learn some more about using Ace Lab. Um, all right. Without further ado, I'd love to hand it over to the folks at Tion Cladding Systems to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Thanks so all much, right. Ben, for joining today. Thank you, uh, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. We good? Yep. Well, good morning. My name is uh, Brewster Crosby, and um, I've got uh, Ben Horn on the on the line with us too. He'll be doing part of this presentation. We both work with Tyon Cladding Systems, and today we're going to talk a little bit about rain screens, the built environment, and achieving net zero. Just quickly, a little bit about Tyon Cladding Systems before we get into the the meat of the material. Here is. Uh, Tyon's an innovative rain screen support system, and we can, through our support system, dramatically reduce the uh, energy needs of buildings. Um, it's a patented system, and it's the frame that connects basically the entire rain screen from the substrate 
waterproofing insulation out to whatever type of cladding you decide to put on the exterior of the building, uh, including solar. Uh, we can improve energy efficiency by up to 40% on the buildings that our system goes on. And most importantly, we're aligned to meet today's policy requirements. And we'll touch a little bit on the policy requirements uh, as we go through this performance, uh, uh, this presentation. So to begin, what, what is net zero? I'm sure most of you guys have heard of this and probably know what it is. Um, but as a refresher, net zero is basically um, achieving that balance between the amount of greenhouse gases produced in the environment and offsetting them or uh, having a, a reducing offset so that the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere is effectively zero. Um, this effort has been um, adopted by organizations and businesses and cities uh, around the world. Um, many countries um, have signed on to net zero goals for 2050. And a lot of this came out of the Paris Climate Agreements in 2016. Um, net zero has really begun to drive a lot of policy, both in building, uh, design, and other ways we um, move forward with our built environment. Um, this is just a small listing of the cities in North America that have agreed to net zero goals. Um, this list in, um, enhances every single day uh, more and more cities are signing on uh, because they know um, to achieve these net zero goals, really every every city has to engage. Um, what you'll see here is um, literally millions upon millions of buildings that need to be updated. Um, and all the new buildings that are being built need to be built in a way that helps achieve uh, net zero. Uh, I'm sure many of you have also heard of the built environment, um, but quickly we'll touch on just what is the built environment. And that's just everything that is our man-made surroundings. Uh, this is buildings, infrastructure, pretty much everything we use um, to make our lives livable. Um, so our buildings that we live in, that we work in, uh, the transportation we take to and from wherever we're going. The important thing about the built environment is there are, are two primary generators of carbon. The first is just to build it and all the materials that have gone into our existing cities and, and living scapes holds a bunch of carbon. This is called embodied carbon. And that carbon is basically what has been put into the buildings from the mines of the materials that, that we get or the timbers uh, to the transportation uh, to get the materials to the building site and all the um, carbon it takes to build a building. Once a building's going or a house or whatever it may be, then there's operating carbon. This is the amount of energy it takes to keep the building uh, warm and cool, uh, lit, uh, all the you know computers and everything we use within these buildings uh, consumes electricity to to operate. And so, you know, the built environment is a is a large, large contributor to um, uh, global emissions. So th these are some interesting figures. The built environment itself, business, federal, state, and local governments own and operate 93 billion square feet of real estate in the United States. That real estate consumes 190 billion in energy costs a year. This is about 35% of all electricity consumed in the United States. And it accounts for 826 million metric tons of carbon dioxide annually. And that's 16% of all our energy uh, or all our carbon um, in the United States each year. Um, when you look at a building, space heating and cooling um, is about 40% of all the energy intensity or energy use in a building. And that's interesting because that's one of the easier things um, that a rain screen or other adaptive measures can help uh, increase so that our buildings are using less energy. 
If you look at something like office equipment, it's just a tiny, tiny fraction of, of the use um, in a building. So how do you achieve net zero in the built environment? There's been a lot of studies on this and a lot of cities and organizations are really looking at driving uh, 10 primary factors to achieve net zero. Um, the first is to decarbonize our energy sources. So this is using cleaner energy sources, as we all know, like wind and solar and wave, um, moving away from coal um, and other carbon generating energy sources. Uh, improving energy efficiency. And this is a big one. This is implementing energy efficient building codes and retrofitting the existing buildings to enhance energy performance. And you'll see how rain screens uh, are a big part of this. Sustainable transportation. This is encouraging the use of public transport, walking, biking, other ways to get to and from. Uh, green infrastructure added into urban planning. Um, this is really putting you know, gardens on rooftops or looking at ways to have buildings increase um, their energy uh, development. So that's adding solar to roofs and facades. Waste reduction and recycling. This really is reducing waste in the landfill. And when you think about the landfill, one of the largest contributors to landfill is actually old building or demo buildings uh, that make their way to the dump site. Um, again, when you think about demoing a building, you are demoing all that embodied carbon and wasting it instead of using the existing footprint to uh, hold that carbon in place while you perhaps do a remodel or a recladding. Uh, resilience and ad adaptation measures. This is what we also have read a lot about, which is adapting to the rising sea levels or extreme weather events and heat waves. Carbon offsetting and removal. These are strategies to offset the remaining carbon emissions through carbon removal. Um, and this is gets, gets rather technical, but you've heard um, about ways to uh, remove carbon, carbon and even bury carbon. Then there's a lot of policy regulations. Um, and we'll touch on New York here in a minute, uh, but policy regulations are really starting to drive these changes and they're using a little bit of carrot and stick uh, practices to get people to update their buildings. Um, community engagement and education, we're seeing this uh, both through uh, media and other, other means to get our businesses and our governments uh, and even um, citizens more aware of what they can do to help achieve net zero. And then lastly, partnerships and collaborations. There are a lot of cities and organizations um, that are trying to collaborate on ways to move quicker into a net zero environment. Um, we are engaged with a great company called uh, Rayana, which is the Rain Screen Association of North America. Um, they're pushing the advantages of rain screens and how it works with net zero. Um, in Europe, there's the Passive House Institute. There's a lot of other organizations out there that are really trying to line up best practices with code so um, we can all hit uh, our net zero goals. I'm going to touch quickly on just what a rain screen is. I'm sure most of you know this already. Um, and then we'll tie it back to how it fits into um, net zero. So a rain screen is just effectively the exterior building envelope and it requires an attachment system. So rain screen will attach to the substrate of the building. Uh, that's the load bearing wall on the building. Uh, typically the next thing that goes up is a water barrier. Think of Tyvek and other type of of water shields that are applied to the exterior of a building. Um, insulation then comes uh, as part of the uh, rain screen. And you see this on many buildings now, um, external insulation, and this can be rigid uh, or uh, more malleable like a, a mineral wool or a rock wool. Um, all this needs to be held together by an attachment system, and you'll learn more about Tyon's attachment system coming up, but there are various types of attachment systems. Um, Tyon has a, an advanced one, uh, but there's other lattice systems and, and clip and rail systems that are in the marketplace today. 
Uh, all rain screens need an airflow, so an air pocket behind the cladding that allows movement of air. This helps um, with heating and cooling. It also helps with reducing um, any sort of uh, moisture and mold concerns that sometimes happen on the exterior buildings. And then lastly, you have your cladding. And this is where you have um, many, many, many different types of cladding from stone to um, fabricated stone, uh, ceramics, metals, solar, uh, what have you. You know, as an architect, you have any, any variety of, of choice on what you want to put on the exterior of a building. Um, and really what that cladding is doing is protecting the building from all the elements out there. So wind, rain, snow, sun, uh, noise, et cetera. And so that's kind of the components of a rain screen. There are significant adva advantages right off the bat to a rain screen. One is it does increase the R value um, up to 90% on the exterior of a building. And depending on the type of rain screen you use or the type attachment system, um, it increases your uh, U value, or I should say dec decreases your U value. So the heat penetration uh, between the exterior and the interior of the building uh, reduces um, substantially. So why is all this important and how does it relate to net zero? This image is, is a scan of New York City and literally where heat is being generated in New York. And um, when you put an advanced rain screen on a building, you can reduce the energy consumption by you know 30 to 40 percent. This study is really just looking at an average savings over 10,000 square feet on an annual basis. And you can see it's, it's a significant amount at 35 grand um, annually. If you apply that out just in New York City alone, you're looking at a massive savings of um, energy uh, just in New York. Apply that across of you know, all the other cities that are looking to do uh, net zero goals and uh, it's a significant amount of energy savings. I touched on this briefly, um, but rain screens do give aesthetic design advantages. Um, you have, you know, color flexibility, range materials, textile or textures, um, and other types of ways that you can make um, rain screens actually very appealing um, for uh, design and, and um, the exterior look of a building. So we talked about the built environment and how many buildings are in the built environment. Uh, in New York City alone, they are estimating that, uh, you know, there's a million buildings that actually could be updated to hit their net zero goals. Um, that's a significant amount of square footage when you think of the exterior envelope of a building. And uh, rain screens can be applied to the existing exterior in a reclad. And recladding is going to be a, a big, big push here in the future um, as we strive to achieve all this in the next, uh, what is it, 25 years, um, and updating all the old buildings. So it saves material waste going to the landfill. I, I commented on that earlier. Uh, it saves cost and time in developing a new building. Um, it provides a lot of the older buildings a nice uh, updated aesthetic look. Uh, it does increase the R value and, and U value performance. Um, it provides better water moisture management um, and increased uh, waterproofing. Um, most importantly, these updates when you reclad uh, allow for building owners to hit the new energy efficiency codes, um, which, is, which is significant. Um, a reclad too will allow for the opportunity to put solar panels on the face of the building, not just the roof. Um, we're finding that roofs are more and more congested with livable space desires um, and a lot of uh, HVAC needs. So uh, moving to a facade for solar performance is something that we're we're seeing quite a bit happen in Europe and it's starting to come over to the US. Um, so you have you know, great advantages of looking at, at a reclad um, in the marketplace. This just looks quickly at 
what um, a solar project, vertical solar project would look like in New York City. Um, and, you know, again, when you put this whole package together and you look at the savings of energy through a uh, high quality rain screen and then the ability to generate energy, uh, you have a really nice offset um, that will drive um, the net zero goals uh, quite rapidly uh, for a lot of the existing footprints in New York City or any other city for that matter. So why is this all happening now? And why is the big push? Well, we know the net zero goals were set by Paris. A lot of the cities have had to adapt to this, New York being one, but Boston's followed suit. Um, San Francisco follow has followed suit, Chicago, Toronto. Um, a lot of these cities are really pushing codes to drive that change. Here in New York, well, actually I'm in Oregon, but in New York City, um, Local Law 97 is the big one that is really pushing uh, building owners to upgrade. And basically what they're saying is if you don't upgrade by a certain set time, you will be fined by the city. So this is that carrot and stick a little bit. Um, New York, like I said, has a million buildings that need to be upgraded. And each of these buildings need to be upgraded by 2050. So the ways to do it is you can improve your energy efficiency on the inside of the building. That might be um, better insulated uh, inside. It might be a better uh, HVAC system. Uh, it could be, as you move to the outside, upgraded windows. But in a lot of cases, it's going to be an upgraded uh, exterior envelope and a rain screen to help provide that energy efficiency. So tie-on cladding systems as an advanced rain screen system, attachment system, um, really begins to attach um, or, or connect a lot of these dots. So with the millions of buildings that need to be upgraded, they have to have a rain screen system and an attachment part of that system to achieve those goals. So our system, and Ben will we'll talk about this here in a minute, um, is designed to work on all substrates. So we can go into brick, we can go into um, you know, a, 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 a wood, we can go into a slab of concrete, whatever it needs to be um, to attach our system to. Our spacing on how we attach to a building is quite a bit less than other systems. So we minimize water barrier penetrations and have um, uh, really great performance when it comes to water barrier protection. Um, we're designed to work with various depths of insulation. So depending on where you are in the country, code will require you to have at least, um, in some places it's none, but it's changing, at least three inches of insulation on the exterior of the building. Uh, in some cases, it's up to 12 inches. And we have the ability to um, incorporate all that depth as needed uh, in a rain screen. Um, our product can span from deck to deck. So this gives us the ability to sort of skip the stud wall um, and go into the floor at 10 or 12 feet um, on any of the buildings that we're going into. Um, one thing I, I haven't touched on, but our system is built and designed to uh, architectural specs in Portland, Oregon. And so we ship a completed um, system with set sizes for the specific location on the building. This lowers time of installation and cost on the job site significantly. It also lowers the carbon impact of the job site because you have less time there with less equipment. Um, we can work with any type of panel, including solar. Uh, we work with all the new code requirements and we do a ton of new construction and a lot of reclads. So Tyon really is well positioned to help you guys in your design world and help a lot of the cities uh, around the country achieve that net zero goal uh, by 2050. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to Ben now to talk a little bit more specifically about, about our product uh, and, our, and our list of products and how they function as a uh, rain screen.
Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Brewster. So Brewster did a great job of basically setting the table to allow me to discuss in more detail what our system is, how it works, the benefits of it, some he laid out just, just a second ago. But um, essentially, I want to give you a sense of what our system actually is, right? What you actually see here on the right is what we call our hanger. And so it's a vertical uh, rail, if you will, with um, clips on the front of it. And, and that is used to attach the actual panel to our system. Um, you can kind of see on the uh, hanger here on the right, uh, you know, every so often there's a, a horizontal darker spot and those are our clips. Now, those can be Z clips, those can be really any type of um, attachment when we're working with, you know, more robust, heavier panels, that attachment is uh, going to need to be a little bit bigger and, you know, able to account for the weight of the panels. But um, all that gets flushed out in engineering, which we do all of um, in-house, uh, and then also shop drawings and, and all that good stuff too. So um, you're really getting a fully vetted out system um, when you're when you're working with us. So again, if you can imagine in this case, just a regular slab of stone, for example, that's you know maybe 10 foot tall by five foot wide, what we would have would be two vertical hangers on either side of that stone that's roughly 10 feet tall. Um, again, like Brewster said, all of our hangers come um, specifically already assembled for the panel geometry of the project. And so there's nothing that the installer needs to do on site to adjust in any way or build anything. Literally, they're just taking the hangers out of the crate and attaching to whatever the substrate is per our shop drawings. Um, if you want to go to the next slide real quick, we have an animation that kind of, well, actually, sorry, take that back. This slide right here shows just a really basic attachment for the clips on the back of the panel that I was mentioning. Um, you know, this is just a really basic Z clip. And, uh, you know, these are what we do is we provide all of the piece tickets or fabrication tickets for whoever is fabricating the panels um, or, or building the panels. And so we tell them exactly where the attachments on the back of the panel need to be to align with the clips on the front of our hangers. Um, so again, it's a totally integrated system with the panel manufacturer as well. This is just a Kyle anchor, which is a really basic, um, you know, undercut anchor that shows how easy it is to attach a, a cleat on the back of the panel. I'll get more into this in a little bit. If you go one more here, this is a basic, just really quick animation of, of how our uh, hangers would be attached. Um, again, there's various different ways, various different substrates. But um, you can see here two hangers going in. That pink stuff is continuous insulation. And you can see the panel going on to the clips of the hanger. And then something I'll get into in just a second is what really sets our system apart from anything else is the adjustment capabilities of our system. Um, just to kind of give you a really quick high level background here, we've done a lot of work with Apple around the world. And what they would typically do, like a lot of other people in the world out there are doing, is using French cleats or you know clips. And um, basically, you have them on the wall. You have them on the back of the panel. You put the panel on the wall. And if it's not right because you know the uh, substrate isn't perfectly framed out, or you know a whole myriad of different other reasons, you would take that panel off. You'd then shim the uh, the the clips or cleats on the wall. And you play that game for a while until you get it just right. Um, the, the gentleman who developed our system um, used to do these installs and had to think, you know, there's got to be a better way to do it. So what we developed was our, our tie-on framing system. And so um, what we have, if you want to press play, Brewster, um, this is a mock-up for a uh, Apple project we did. And you can see here, this is our hanger and we're just attaching directly to some plywood. Um, again, you know, various different types of substrates, but this was pretty basic. And on top of our hanger, there are what we have adjustment bolts. And by manipulating these bolts, you can see that you can actually adjust that entire hanger in and out. So that will adjust the top of the hanger. The middle bolt here adjusts the front hook plate. So you can move that panel up and down. And then the one on the left here does the same adjustment to the bottom of the hanger in and out as well. Um, it'll zoom out. It's a little harder to see because it's further out, but you can see that it moves in and out. So you're able to adjust that panel while it's on the wall. Triaxial adjustment. You never have to take the panel off the wall. Um, this is just showing the, uh, how the how the panel sits on our hanger. In this case, we were just using a pretty basic C-channel armature. But you can see here, if the panel's not in perfect alignment in plane, 
you can see how easy it is to, you know, within in a matter of seconds, uh, get that panel perfectly aligned with everything else next to it. This process can take, if you're not familiar with the installation process of, of this type of work, can be very arduous and take a long, long time. So, so just based off that alone, there's a significant time savings on getting panels and everything in line. I'm sure you've all seen projects, um, hopefully not your own, that uh, you know when you're looking at the facade or other types of cladding, it doesn't line up just right. And we are able to achieve absolute perfect alignment every single time. Um, and I'll get into kind of the extreme conditions sometimes when working with a client like Apple that, that shows that. So next slide. <clears throat> so this basically, if you're not familiar with other types of systems, Brewster mentioned clip and rail systems or grids or lattices, however you want to kind of explain it. On the left-hand side is a example of um, that type of uh, uh, an attachment system. Um, and, you know, so basically what you have is a box full of components. You can see there's horizontal rails, vertical rails, there's clips. And what you do as the installer is open that box up and essentially put it together on the wall like a Lego set. You have to measure and cut all those different members. Um, and there's quite a few clips, as you can see, um, on the, attaching back to the substrate. In this case, just the plywood wall. This, this comparison was done at our facility in Portland. What we did basically was just want to measure from a time standpoint, how much time we're actually saving on an installation. So we took two five foot by five foot panels uh, and installed two panels on uh, a competitor system and then two panels on our system. So you can see just by looking here um, on the right hand side is our system. You know, there's two vertical hangers and the uh, metallic clips on the front you can see as well. They already come again preset on the pan on the hangers. So literally the installer, again, just takes those already assembled vertical members out of the crate and attaches it to the wall uh, based off the spacing that we provide. So that's basically what the wall looks like prior to. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of recap, uh, well, actually go back one, sorry, Brewster. Um, mm -hmm. this, this exercise, and there's a video that I think is on our, um, uh, Ace Lab page, if you want to look in, in more detail, but basically when it all came down to it, to put the systems on the wall and then put the panels, because there's a bunch of stuff on the back of the panel that you need to attach as well, to put the systems on the wall, attach the panels. Um, from start to finish, it took the competitor system 151 minutes, and that's 50 square feet in perfect condition, you know, on the ground, there's no scaffolding or lifts or anything you're messing with. Um, took them 151 minutes. Our system on the right, took 35 minutes. So if you start extrapolating that out over, you know, in this case, 50 square feet to a thousand, 10,000, hundred thousand square feet, it starts making a lot of sense really quick. And with labor being the most expensive part of the job, um, our installers that we work with around the world have been very quick to adopt our system based off just the labor savings alone. So go ahead, bro. So this is again, uh, just another view of on the left, um, um, you know, the kind of clip and rail uh, systems that you traditionally see a lot more of out there in the market. And then on the right is an example of a very similar type of construction um, with our system. You can see the vertical black hangers um, and then in between, and I'll get into this in a little bit, just a second, but you can see how we are able to put the continuous insulation back behind the, the front plate of the hanger. Um, it's just a, you know, a different way of doing things, but that in our case lends, uh, significant time savings. Next. So just to give you a sense of real quick of, from an aesthetic standpoint, how perfect we can get things. This is the biggest Apple store in the world in Dubai. Uh, on the left-hand picture, you can see people standing there next to those giant sunshades, give you a sense of scale. I think those are about 40 feet tall. The entire interior and exterior of this building is clad with pretty massive GFRC panels. There's two stairwells on either side of that store. So it's two stories. And the middle picture is basically a shot of before the panels went on. Um, you can see this is a, a at the, the landing of one of the stairwells going up to the left. But the blue vertical members there are hangers. And in this case, these panels you can see on the right were 18, 20 foot tall GFRC panels that weighed a couple thousand pounds a piece. So we just designed a tube steel reinforcement wall with a horizontal unistrut. And you can see there's a lot of manpower involved to get these panels into place. Um, they, you know, obviously are very heavy. You go next slide. 
The picture on the left is looking down that same stairwell. So you can see what they did was actually pour the handrails into the panels. Really, really cool feature. If you're ever in Dubai, go check it out. Um, and in the picture on the right is a intersection of four of those panels. So you can see there, if that joint isn't perfect on the handrail, you're going to feel it on your hand. And um, Apple Lebs likes for things to be perfect. So those joints are three millimeters. Those are the tolerance we had. And we had a guy show up from Italy with a piece of plastic and he checked every single joint. And he would say, hey, this panel's got to come up half a millimeter or out a millimeter. And you know we're able to achieve that uh, with the adjustment capabilities of our system. So I, I don't know of any other system in the world that can do that. And if you find one that has adjustment like that, let me know because our IP lawyers are got everything wrapped up pretty tight. So um, next slide. So back to just the continuous insulation piece, I wanted to kind of focus on the design of our hanger. If you look at the left uh, diagram there, that's a top-down view. And you can see uh, the front adjustment hook plate there in the, in the front part of the hanger. Um, but what we have is kind of a T profile. These are just different aluminum extrusions. Um, and we have, you know, the ability to use different extrusion depths, as Brewster was talking about, to account for different depths of insulation. So you can see behind the hook plate, there's a cavity. And again, if it needs to be three inches or 12 inches or whatever, we just use a different um, extrusion that'll push that whole uh, build, build out further. So um, again, you can see in these pictures here. Uh, kind of the the steps taken in, a, in an installation on the far right, you can see um, these panels that are up on the wall here. And so when we're talking about large format panels like this, it's pretty straightforward. You have your two hangers, um, you have your, you know, your horizontal clips on the front that um, get picked up on the, and it, depending on what the material is, the weight, the wind loading, et cetera, you know, that'll get flushed out in engineering, but how many times do you have to pick up that panel, right? So like I said, a large format piece of cake. Next slide. If we're talking about smaller uh, panel geometries, like you see here on the left and in the middle there, so Golden State Warriors Arena in the middle, Chase Center, we did that project, and you can see that there's much smaller panels. What we're doing is not putting two hangers per panel. Um, instead of that, you know, we, we try to minimize the amount of hangers on a project for cost purposes. So what we'll do in this case is uh, unitize it or panelize it. And so you can see here in this diagram, basically there's a, a tie-on unitizing frame. So we will fabricate these frames and um, the installer will attach the panels to that frame prior to actually installing it to the building. So essentially all we're doing, you can see on the right here is a mock-up. Um, you know, we left two panels off on purpose so you can see through it, but there's a hanger there in blue on the right. And there's another one on the left that's covered up by the panels, but you can see the black frame um, that is ultimately attached to the hangers. And so again, the installer is attaching all those individual panels to that frame and essentially we're just making a larger panel. So this is the, an example of a project here in uh, San Mateo, California. Um, this is a reclad of a building and uh, you can see the vertical pieces uh, on the facade there. Those are our hangers. This is an older building that you know had tile that was falling off. They wanted to give it a facelift. And um, so you know what we did is we came in, installed uh, our installers installed the hangers and um, basically, they had originally estimated a 66-day duration using a more traditional clip and rail type system that I showed you prior. And with our system and our approach with panelizing it, they did it in 16 days. So, you know, for a various amount of reasons, that's advantageous. Um, and, you know, at the very bottom is, is the cost. So that's, that's the uh, finished product there. Next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just another another look of those panelized uh, systems approaches. You can see here, this is the Chase Center again. You know, the entire uh, arena is is at the at the ground level is covered, and we have you know vertical sections, if you will. So we're not putting up those individual pieces, uh, and it it just it works out really really well. So, and this is uh, just an example of uh, some other type of work we've done, interior cladding as well. You know, there's obviously, you know, a huge focus of this is on the exterior, but um, we do a lot of interior work too. So interior stone, interior cladding of any kind. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from Gensler here, but this is a project we did with Gensler in San Francisco that we won some awards on. So pretty, pretty interesting um, stuff at the Embarcadero Center. So. And that's 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 in conclusion there. So, I think at, at this point, um, and and Bo, you can correct me, but uh, do we have time for a Q and A? If there's any questions out there, yeah, we definitely have some time for Q and A. So, 
Um, just a reminder to folks, we do have a Q&A box. You can submit questions there. You can also raise your hand. There's a little option to do that um, where your Zoom controls are. Um, and you can ask a question out loud if you would like. You don't have to turn your video on, um, but I'll just keep my eye out for that. If anybody raises their hand, I'll unmute them. Um, if you have a long question or like a project specific question, it can sometimes be easier to ask it out loud rather than type it in the chat, but feel free to use the Q&A box as well. Um, all right, so it looks like we do have one question in here. How do you test and check substrates behind the rain screens, especially on such large scale buildings? So one more time, sorry, I, I caught like half that. No, no worries. Um, how do you test and check substrates behind the rain screens, especially on such a large scale building? Okay, well, I mean, you could talk directly about Colorado, probably the, yeah, I mean, so so first of all, for from Tyon's perspective, um, every time we do a a reclad or any type of job, um, our we have an engineering team that looks at the specific um, substrate that we're going into. So um, it is all uh, engineer reviewed and then designed per local engineering specs, and then. Uh, ultimately stamped prior to our product going on. The interesting thing is once a product, our product is on, um, because our system is adjustable and Ben showed how the system can tilt in and tilt out, um, if you need to do checks on the attachment or on the substrate in the life of the system, um, what's unique about tie-on is you can actually take panels off when you need to. And this can happen, you know, anywhere on a building, you can pop a panel out and go in and look at the substrate behind it if you need to do that. Other reasons people will pop a panel off is if, you know, at the ground level, a panel's been damaged or graffitied or kicked in, what have you. But um, in most cases, uh, you can go in and uh, pop a panel off and study the substrate behind it um, if needed. But again, before Tyon goes on any building, it's already been in, uh, independently engineered and stamped. So to piggyback on that, let me share my screen real quick if I can. Can you can you see this okay? Yep. So basically, the way we design our hangers, so you can see this is a, a view of the bottom of a hanger and then the top of another hanger. Um, we, again, work with the panel manufacturer to make sure that the panels are perfectly aligned with our hangers so that what we have here is our top cap and these are our adjustment bolts right here. Typically in a rain screen, you're going to see anywhere from, you know, a, a quarter, three eighths inch joint in between panels. Um, and in, in the field, our, our uh, bolts are actually a little bit taller. But you can actually stick a tool in there um, that allows you to tilt our hanger out and uh, like Bruce was talking about, remove a panel. And then for whatever reason, if you need to get back there, you can. And then if this panel was damaged or whatever it may be, you could actually then replace it. So you don't have to take panels above it or below it off. You can actually, again, access through that joint um, and, and, and manipulate those panels if, if you need to. Awesome. All right, looks like we've got some folks with their hands raised. So James, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you now um, and let you ask your question out loud. All right, hey James, how's it going? Let's see. Maybe he forgot he had his hand raised. I'm gonna, I'm gonna disable your talking James for a moment, but if you did have a question, just uh, let us know in the chat. All right, and we have David up next, who has a hand raised. So we're going to see if you want to ask a question out loud. Hey, David, how's it going? Let's see. Nope, maybe folks just playing around with the hand raising feature. All right, I'm going to disable. Oh, let's see, he's unmuted now. David, did you have a question you wanted to ask out loud? Uh, actually, my question got answered the last time about moving a panel off without up or, or below or so. Thanks. Awesome. Yep. All right. Thank you, David. Okay, we do have a few questions in the chat, so I'll go ahead and start reading through some of those now. 
Um, Will asks, does Tyon have a thermally broken attachment plate option, or are there any issues adding a structural thermal break between the clip and the backup wall if needed? Yeah, no, we um, our, our system's thermally broken. Uh, we've done all of our testing with RDH. Um, <clears throat> we essentially put uh, one of the thermal bridges behind our mounting bracket in between, and then we will utilize any of the, uh, the hardware necessary as well. Um, we also have a couple different options for mounting brackets. Uh, we have a stainless steel mounting bracket that is, you know, thermally much, you know, more efficient than uh, aluminum. Um, also allows for, uh, you know, more strength if need be. We're utilizing that on a couple projects right now. One particularly up in Toronto. Uh, so, you know, there's some some higher needs there. Um, anything else you'd add to that, Brewster? No, I we're we're. we're... Um, in good shape on the thermal performance. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that with our system, as you could see in that in that one example I showed side by side of the two systems, um, our system attaches back to the structure so fewer places than other types of systems. Other systems are typically, you know, maybe 16 inches on center. So you have a lot more um, clips and stuff that go back to the structure, whereas we're able to spread our hangers out you know, six feet, eight feet sometimes really kind of depends on on the the panels or the, the project specifics. So um, there's there's far more or far less attachments back, which is advantageous for us with from a thermal standpoint. Awesome. All right. So up next, we've got what about penetrations in the water moisture barrier to support the rails? How do you control water penetration? So we, the installers will just go back and patch it over it, um, goop it or, or whatever uh, is, you know, the, the common practice, I guess. Um, it's nothing that, you know, so we don't do our own installations. We partner with uh, various different installers around the country. And a big part of what I do is, you know, go support our sales reps throughout the country, but also to build those relationships, um, you know, with installers uh, around the country and, you know, into Canada and stuff. So um, they have, you know, their kind of means and methods, I think, throughout uh, their different regions on, on how they handle any kind of penetrations. But the fact that our system does, again, uh, you know, in that example I showed, there was uh, 72 penetrations for the other type of system. Ours had 24. So you're talking about, you know, a two thirds less um, amount of penetrations through whatever water barrier you're dealing with. So there's far less uh, chance for any kind of issues with, with leakage or. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Moving on to the next, what type of backing do we need in our framing to attach the tie-on system and who engineers that? So we would be the ones engineering that. We work with uh, Rice Engineering quite a bit up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, if you're familiar with them. So they're one of the more prominent structural groups out there. Uh, we also have a couple more localized groups we work with. But all the engineering as far as attaching back to the structure and, and basically what we will do is tell you what we will need, right? So whoever's either framing it or, you know, this, this, the structural, the steel guys or wh whoever it may be we'll let you know exactly what we needed to attach to. So um, if if we can, you know, depending on the project and typically wind loading is the, the big factor, um, you know, sometimes we can attach directly back to, you know, um, plywood substrates or, you know, if there's CMU fully grouted blocks or whatever the substrate may be, we'll spec out whatever that attachment method or hardware we need is. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Um, in New York City, we have so many brick buildings that require checking every few years because of potential mortar and lintel deterioration, costly without the rain screens, but more so with a rain screen. Um, I'm discussing retrofit projects. So this was from Richard, I think, as a follow-up to uh, a question that he had asked about checking substrates behind the rain screens. Well, I mean... Yeah. So there's that one gentleman we met with uh, who we've been working on some projects with, Tony, who that's what his job is, is to go and do investigatory work, investigative work on um, on existing substrates in New York City specifically. He's based out of New York City. Um, I don't know if you want to yeah. go deeper. I, I don't see that requirement changing in New York anytime soon. I guess, you know, again, the the advantage of our system versus other systems like a um you know clip and rail system is 
you can remove the panel and do that work. Um, where other other systems, it's virtually once the panels go on, it's really, really difficult to get behind them and do the work. And, and frankly, I don't know how they're going to do it. But um, from our perspective, again, pop it off. If there's insulation, you can peel it back and you can do a full study of, of um, that brick substrate as needed. And, and Richard, I don't, I don't know if you're um, talking about prior to the project even starting. Um, if you're, if you mean like, you know, doing that initial investigatory, you know, pull the wall open and look and see what's back there type work. Um, you know, we, we don't get involved in any of that. Uh, typically, um, it, it, there, there has been cases where, you know, mid project, there's been, you know, some, some investigatory work on a wall that needs to be done, but typically that's already done, um, by a, a, like a group that we've met with and we have relationships with, they'll go in prior to, and, and do that assessment before we you know do any engineering so we, like you said know what we're attaching to all right um i believe we covered this one already but we've got a question here about if the system is thermally broken i believe the answer was yes all right awesome and then we had one other question that came in earlier about um if somebody could receive a copy of the presentation after today's webinar is that something you'd be willing to share with folks sure absolutely yeah, um, I believe, Bo, do we have uh, stuff on our page that we have a couple of videos on there as well, correct? Don't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll uh, send a link in the chat now to your page on Ace Lab. Um, that's a great place to go for additional information, um, watching videos, getting some more product information. Um, and you can also reach out to the Tie On team directly through that page as well. So if you want some follow up information or to connect with them about a project, that's a great place to go. Okay, so let me send that over in a moment. All right, so that link should be in the chat. Um, you can use that to head right over to the tie on cladding systems page on Ace Lab. We've got a bunch of resources there, and again, that direct button to reach out to their team. All right, um, while we've got a few more minutes left, just wanna check and see if there are any other last minute questions. Um, if you have a question that you think of after today's webinar, there will be a quick survey at the end of the webinar. So if you can fill that out, that's super helpful for us um, and feel free to leave any other questions that you might have uh, for the Tyon team in that survey as well. Right. Got some thank yous coming into the chat. So looks like we might be all done with questions for now. Um, I'll give everyone another minute or so before we wrap up. Awesome. As we're waiting, I just I want to thank you all for the time and and um we're here to answer any questions you may have. If you want to copy the deck, just please let us know and we're happy to to um, touch on anything that that perhaps was left unanswered too. Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat. So thank you everyone in the audience for joining today. We really appreciate all of your engagement um, for showing up and asking such great questions. Um, and again, feel free to grab that link from the chat before we head off today so that you can get in touch with Tyon after today's webinar. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you at another one of our events soon. Thank you so much, Brewster and Ben, for uh, today's amazing presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.